Thank you for your patience. Okay, so hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Chris O'Connor and I'm filling in for your trusty host, Kim Golf. Kim is on vacation for the next few weeks, so I will do my best to fill her shoes until she returns. Both Kim and I are learning program developers here at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I am an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live and learn and raise a family on this land. During this pandemic period, it has felt at times that everything is upside down, but we do our best to find ways to cobble together some semblance of normal. We're trying to lean into the familiar. One familiar tradition for many over the summer months is to go on vacations. So for RBCM at home for the months of July and August, we'll be virtually visiting museums and cultural organizations across the province, going on a road trip together. So buckle up. Last week we visited um, Barkerville. So we're getting back in the car and heading south. And in the words of the Squamish Lillooet Cultural Center, we are making our way to where the rivers and mountains and people meet. We drive into Whistler and pull up to the Squamish Lillooet Cultural Center, where we are met by Alison Pascal. Both the Squamish and Lillooet nations have distinct but shared histories as neighbors since time immemorial. However, in 2001, the two nations signed what turned out to be a historic protocol agreement, which formalized their rel mutual relationship in regard to cultural and economic development and co-management of shared territory. The Squamish Lillooet Cultural Center was created from that agreement and Alison Pascal from the Lillooet Nation is a curator at the center. So thank you so much, Alison, for having us. We're so grateful to be able to spend time with you today and learn about the center. And I just wanted to say first, is, is, that, a, is that fair what I said in terms of mm -hmm. the, the uh, agreement and the cultural center or would you like to add or? Um. Yes. That, hi, Chris. Thank you hi. for having us and thanks for visiting the SLCC. Uh, yeah, that was really, really good. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is the protocol agreement is an ancient agreement. So mm -hmm. it comes before our time. It actually comes, you know, when you're driving into Whistler and you can start to see black tusks. Our share, we used to have a shared village at the bottom where members from the Squamish and the Lua Nation can live and, you know, trade amongst each other and gather all of the resources. Um, so that agreement uh, predates or comes from the time when the volcano was still like a mountain and not just the volcano core. So it's a very, very ancient agreement. And it was, the protocol was reformalized in 2001. Um, so it was just brought back to our knowledge and to the time when I guess all of our members can understand that the Squamish Nation and the Lua Nation have this historic agreement that we live and work together um, as friends, family, and neighbors. Mm. Yeah, thank you for, mm -hmm. for adding that, that, that important detail because mm -hmm. it a, it's a continued legacy mm -hmm. over many years mm -hmm. and um, so I, um, I'm, I'm really interested to learn more. We're really interested to learn more about uh, mm -hmm. the cultural center. So um, mm -hmm. what, how would, what would you like to say to begin um, um, about, about that? Yeah, so yeah, our cultural center um, is kind of like to celebrate the living cultures of the Squamish and the Luat Nation. Um, it's a nice big open space that reflects the two traditional homes, the um, longhouse of the Squamish Nation and also the Ishkin or the pit house of the Luat Nation. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to be really nice and open and bright because we're people of the land. And so the home, the land is kind of like that was our original house. So when we we're building the center, we wanted people to feel like they were coming back out onto the land with us. 
and so it's really nice. You can, we have the beautiful view of Lost Lake Park across the road from us, mm -hmm. and it takes you through to see all of the important aspects of who we are. Uh, we celebrate the cedar tree, the tree of life, uh, because out of the cedar, we can make our homes, tools, artwork, clothing. Um, it's our spiritual protection. So a lot of what you see when you come into the center is made out of the cedar tree. Mm. Um, right now, we're kind of like planning to do a language installation. We had um, interactive displays that were put in when we were first open, but over time the technology has become obsolete. And so we're looking for a way to put language, like a sound or audio video presentation into it. So you can, we have the language in our panels, but you can't really hear it right now. Mm -hmm. And so we want to do something really fresh and really vibrant to put back into the center itself. So pe when people come in, they can not only read it, they can also hear it. Mm -hmm. um, our cultural center is mainly staffed by youth within the nations. And so we don't always have that really deep connection where you got to grow up as a fluent speaker. Uh, we have uh, staff members that have gone through our community school and in, instead of French or Spanish, they get to speak Uchamuch as their second language and that's their second language component. And we have um, one staff member that's done the immersion program, but mm -hmm. so far for our language level proficiency is really low. Um, Last winter, we were able to receive a grant to work on a CD to kind of like bring language lessons back into our team. And mm -hmm. so we are just releasing volume three of our CD. Uh, so that was really exciting because it gave a small portion of our team the opportunity to learn more language. And then as, you know, the coronavirus kind of social distancing lifts, we're able to go out into the community and share some of those songs that have been put away because the lack of, I guess, language knowledge ha isn't as strong as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and language is, is so important to, mm -hmm. to culture, so. So you're saying that as soon as people come in, that, that language, uh, language would be present and, and be mm -hmm. something that they first mm -hmm. experience when they're coming in. Yeah. Well, Can you talk a little on, bit? Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, currently it's on all of our panels, um, all of our text panels, but it's not spoken and mm -hmm. it's not kind of like readily available for people to hear. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your your staff and and who mm -hmm. who works there and 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 what kinds of things they do? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're I guess I want to say eighty five percent of our staff is Indigenous people from the Squamish and the Lua Nation, with our administration um, positions open to everybody. But predominantly when we hire, we hire Indigenous people from the Squamish and the Lua Nation. Okay. Yeah. Most of our community lives in North Vancouver, Squamish Valley for the Squamish Nation, or up in Mount Curry and Pemberton for the Lua Nation, and everybody commutes to Whistler. Um, right, converging into the, 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 to the cultural center. Mm -hmm. So you're in you're in the center right now. You said you're in gallery mm -hmm. two. Yes, I am. Can yeah, you so, can you give us a little sense of where if we were there with you, what we what we would be seeing? Uh, gallery two is our uh, exhibit called honoring. Uh, it's honoring the gifts of the land. So this is right before you go out to our outdoor spaces. 
And so right behind me is the Salish wool weaving, uh, which if it was a completely traditional blanket, it would have been the mountain goat fur and Salish dog. Uh, this one is a cotton polyester blend. But if you're looking behind me, um, we have some taxidermy pieces. There's a bald eagle and a cougar, and there's our deer mask. And then maybe I'll just get up and walk a little bit closer. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, most we're people of the land, so we make use of everything that we can find in our territory. And I was saying that cedar is our tree of life. Uh, so we have our cedar rope with the cedar mat. And then over here, for the Lutwat Nation especially, um, I'm not too sure if that's how clear that is to see, but it's some of our cedar roots. So you have the cedar roots as they come out of the ground in the coil, and then right before it, in front of it, is the cedar roots that are split and some of the wild cherry bark. Uh, so for the Lutwa Nation, we would use cedar root baskets for gathering and storing food. We make our baby baskets out of them. And they were also made into cooking baskets uh, so we could uh, make soup out of them. Um, here it also shows, let's see, some of our snowshoes, um, which those will be put away very shortly. They're usually only out for the winter time. Uh, so people could see how in this area when it was, you know, like two feet of snow or six feet of snow in the old days, how we would get around. Um, and and then those, we'll are, replace those are made that. with cedar root as well? Um, those are made with cedar for the outer rim. And then it would have been some of the sinew for the lacing. Mm. Uh, those could also be made out of yew wood, but Right now, you is hard to find, so they can also be made out of cedar. Mm -hmm. And then here, so for gifts of the land, it shows some of our medicinal properties. In our cedar berry basket, we have lichen, and lichen is really good as a, an immune booster. So mm -hmm. if you were out for a long time and felt yourself, you know, kind of getting a little bit tired and a little, a little bit sick, you could get some of that lichen, rinse it off, roll it into a little ball and put it under your tongue and let it dissolve. Mm -hmm. And that's just a little bit of extra vitamins. Um, that lichen is also kind of like your emergency food. If you're out longer than you anticipate and you run out of food, you can make it into like a jelly and it will help you to feel full and keep you alive. Oh. Um, I, don't Im I don't imagine that it would taste very good, but it's kind of like that little bit of food that you can find if you're in an emergency situation. Right, especially with snow too, because the lichen would be higher up on the tree, mm -hmm. so you'd be mm -hmm. able to actually access that in the, when it's mm -hmm. deep snow. Mm -hmm. um, right beside it, uh, Hopefully, can you see the birch bark basket mm -hmm. with the pink flowers? Right. Um, we also have um, it's red flowering current. Uh, so the flowers are only available in the early spring. And if you gather them and dry them, you can make them into tea later. And it's a blood cleanser. So it's really good for people with diabetes because it will clean your blood of all of that uh, excess sugar. Um, yeah, it also helps to boost your energy because you've got fresh blood flowing through. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we in the Lutwa territory, we do have birch bark baskets. Uh, so you, we did have them and make them for uh, storing lighter objects. Uh, this one here is uh, donated to the center from somebody that came through on a visit and they thought, 
they really wanted to help us out, so they donated some birch bark basket. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And another gift of our land is some of the ochre. Uh, in the Squamish language, it's called tummet, and it's an iron oxide earth material. It's a natural pigment. So our pictographs would have been uh, painted and made with ochre. And it's uh, from Simon Fraser University, from one of our colleagues of Rudy Reimer, Dr. Rudy Reimer. And so it's different samples from the Squamish territory, and then also from Carameas, Oregon, and they have some French and Cuban samples. I'll have a closer look. And you can see all of the ochres take different color tones. In that, it says it's from the amount of water content in the pigment itself. So I'm not really too sure how that works, but I know you can change the tones um, to be darker if you heat the pigment up. Uh, we haven't, because we have such a small sample size, we haven't tried to heat any of it up because once you heat it up, you can't kind of go backwards and change it back to normal. Um, but, but if I you had enough of it, if you had mm -hmm. enough of it, you might be able to experiment with that and see. Mm -hmm. um, Allison, we had a, a comment, just uh, someone wanted to see the birch bark baskets again, so if you oh, don't mind yeah. showing them. Uh, so right now in this gallery, we only have uh, this one. I think the others are really low light. Let me have mm. a walk over. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of the designs are from people up north. Uh, in this area, we didn't do the biting. We just did like the plain basket designs. Uh, but also here we have very popular uh, the mecha, the black bear. Um, we are donated the fur by another family. Uh, the lady, uh, her husband was a hunter in the area. And so when he passed away, she was a little bit scared of the furs and so she wanted to donate them to us because um, they she thought they would be a really good fit and one of our most recent donations is our um, grizzly bear Kithlalem. Mm -hmm. Was that from the same person who donated? Uh, different people. Oh, okay. This is from a lady, her husband owned a taxidermy shop. And so after he passed away, they shut down the shop and she wanted to donate them to somebody that would really, you know, appreciate them and take care of them. Right. Mm. Which clearly you are. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a new installation from after opening up from the coronavirus shutdown. Oh, yeah. So just for people that are watching, you're, you're open now, um, we are. and the, the days that you're open, you were saying? Uh, we're open Thursdays to Sundays. Um, first hour of the day is for our elderly visitors and those that might have um, immunity, co compromised immunities. Um, so we're open 10 to 11 for those visitors. And then for everybody else, we're open from 11 till 5. Do they need to get a, a ticket beforehand in order to um, make sure there's not too many people in there at one time? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here, summer is kind of our quieter season. So we do have online purchases, but you can still purchase your ticket the day of while you're here. OK, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll just head outside because another new program uh, since the coronavirus and social distancing um, is our forest walk. Last summer, we were only doing forest walks uh, three o'clock on Wednesdays, and now every day we're open, we have them available 
at 11 and also 3. Oh, all right. Yeah. Let me just get. And so forest walks is something that is new to myself and also most of our staff. Uh, so we've been researching it, reaching out to some of our members that this is their passion in life. And so to help us, we've made these little cards. Um, so it shows what plants we have in our yard and also gives a little bit of information of what we would use them for. So I'm just heading out into our backyard. We're very fortunate to have a, some property, outdoor property, and this is our mezzanine deck. Oh, wow. And yeah, behind me you can see leads up into our forest walk which um, our workers, our ambassadors, will take people out to visit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been a beautiful, unnaturally, like a beautiful <laughs> yeah, it's been unnaturally wet, like we're from, we call it the wet coast or the west coast, right. but um, we've haven't had a lot of sunshine, so today is really nice that it's really nice and sunny out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it seems like that's a that's an area that you can have a roof on and have outdoor mm -hmm. outdoor yeah. events in that area. Yeah, yeah, we have a retractable awning, so we host a lot of, uh, or we normally would host a lot of events out in this area. Right. Um, but yeah, today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with our forest walk, can you see this? I yeah, we can. The the white plant. This is yarrow. So this is a traditional uh, plant found within our territory. And yarrow is really good for women, especially in all its stages. You would use it to help treat kind of women's organs. You make it as a tea. But for everybody, these leaves, um, can you see the leaves here? Uh -huh. Uh, those, if you're out, you can rub them on your skin and it's like a natural mosquito repellent. Oh. Um, so that's one of the things we would use to keep the bugs at bay uh, because of all of the rain, we have a lot of mosquitoes yeah. <laughs> and flies right now. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. So you just, you take off a little bit and then rub it on your skin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually one probably one leaf per plant because right. you don't want to kill the plant. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, one of the things I'm learning about right now is fireweed. So before fireweed, I didn't know how useful it could be. When they're still really young, um, you can eat them. So I'm not too sure which part. I just think it's like asparagus if it's nice and tender um, you can eat it but as it is um, you can this is one of the sources we would use for making rope out of our preferred rope material is the cedar bark but cedar bark you can only harvest while the sap is running and you can only take like a little bit of the bark once in its whole life um, so fireweed because it's so abundant um, you can cut this and you kind of really want to take all of the juicy material out and separate it down to its um, long fibers mm -hmm. but there's so much of it that it really there's really a lot of it available throughout the year um, so if you're in a pinch out um, and you need a lot of a lot more rope than you anticipated. You can make it out of fireweed. Um, do you do both any of those? Oh no, sorry. sorry. Do you do I any workshop? Do you do any workshops to show how to to do that process? Um, for making fireweed, no, but making rope, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we used to be able to do it out of cedar bark, but because the supplies in our territories are really over harvested right now. Like last summer we did a weaving program and our master weavers were saying that um, 
people are starting to over harvest. We stopped using cedar bark and now have moved to a raffia. Oh, oh sorry. Hi. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So we moved to raffia, which is kind of more abundant, and we can still teach people how to make uh, rope. Mm -hmm. Which I think all of that is good learning, right? Of how mm -hmm. to be mindful of not over harvesting and mm -hmm. to 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 just be respectful of the materials, right? So mm -hmm. all of that is really good learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was really nice, uh, especially for our staff uh, to see. Now we save any projects we make out of cedar bark uh, for some of the bigger, more traditional projects that we might have. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, we have um, a regalia project going. Uh, it's a second phase of the regalia project. It's more of the cultural growth and sharing for mm -hmm. when we get requested to go out and do welcome songs or blessings and performances. And so, we have our staff coming in on Wednesdays and they're working on some of the, I guess we could call them props, but they're their pieces they use in the performances to enhance or the visual aspect. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon the team is gonna get into learning some of those language songs and um, creating dances for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to have more of a presentation or like a show at the end of the summer to show off what the team has learned and created. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is all found on top of our Ishkin, which is our pit house. Uh, that would have been the traditional home of the Lutwat Nation. Uh, we made our houses underground uh, because it keeps us nice and cool in the summer and it would keep us warm through the winter. So the houses were meant to blend into the landscape, mm. which is a form of defense for us. Um, we're more of a peaceful people, so we didn't go out and start wars, but if people were trying to come in and kind of like help themselves to our fish, we could defend ourselves. Mm. So on our Ishkin, we have a lot of really great plants. And this is some of the wild roses. Um, wild roses, they're out of bloom now, but you can see the buds or the rose hips are still there. Um, wild roses are really good for tea. Um, the rose petals you can make into like a toner, you know, to help clean your face. I this year made it into an oil. Uh, my sister makes homemade soaps, so hope she's going to make some soaps for me with the rose oil I have. Uh, it's really nice and gentle uh, mm. for the skin. Um, I know you can also make it into tea, but I'm not really, I'm not to the level where I'm confident to make, make it into a tea. Um, the rose hip we would harvest after the frost. Um, I know there's a layer in there that you have to take out, otherwise you'll just get irritated in the stomach and really itchy. Uh, so there's a lot that yeah, I'm that, still learning about. You have to learn yeah. that technique before. Yeah. 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 So that might be a next year's project. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I know it's really great. It's actually, it's one of my favorite plants and it really reminds me when I used to live away from my home territory, wild roses, it would just bring me right back to my childhood oh, because nice. uh, we spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house and my grandma had a lot of wild roses in and around the yard. So for me, this kind of like represents summer and being at home and um, just being outside and enjoying the territory. Right. Nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. We um, have a few more minutes, Allison. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, can you, uh, the, uh, the pit house that you were showing, um, mm -hmm. can you just scan your camera just to show, show it again? Just. Oh, 
Um, so here's the pit house. Oh, it, yeah. We're we're actually closed for business today, and I forgot to open the doors. Oh, the, that's okay. Can you see the door? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So usually that's open for people to mm -hmm. be inside as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you see? We have a sign outside. Um, before you go in, it talks about a little bit about how many people would live there and some of the features of the home, like the the ladder that's found in the middle. It was mm -hmm. their one of their entrances. Mm -hmm. um, the entrance we have here available. Um, in the Ishkins, they would have had like the main entrance at the top with the smoke hole and for the men, uh, the side entrance for ladies, children and elderly. Was, it used to be hidden, so it was like that emergency escape if um, you did get attacked by enemies. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so it, wouldn't, it wouldn't look like it looks right now. Because no. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have been like a tunnel. Like if you were right. watching The Hobbit and you think about how The Hobbits kind of like went out in tunnels, right. uh -huh. it's kind of like that idea. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing I'm still learning about, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to identify trees in the wild, <laughs> which, uh, but I do know that most of the young green needles on trees, you can also harvest for teas. Uh, some of them, especially the pine tree, uh, is also good for washing your hair. So they would kind of like let it soak in water and clear out the needles and that's how you used to wash your hair mm. but yeah it's just like for me math I never keep math in uh -huh. my head <laughs> right. so I I have a hard time identifying trees right. out in the wild me me too <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Allison. It, it was, it's amazing the uh, just you being inside and outside, seeing that the, the center mm -hmm. is, it seems like there's this natural flow between the inside and the outside of the mm -hmm. space. And the, the learning continues inside and outside. Um, mm -hmm. I know we've gotten a couple of comments so far just saying that they haven't been there before, but they're really looking mm -hmm. forward next time they're in Whistler to, to come oh, visit. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the comments says they're particularly thankful about the information about yarrow leaves um, and mosquito repellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so, definitely. <laughs> um, so I, um, I just wanted to, to thank you again so much for, for showing uh, the space and for the amazing work that that you you do and the other mm -hmm. you as a curator but the ambassadors throughout the 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 center just showing mm -hmm. and I, I think another thing that you you said that I just will stick with me is just your your constant um, as a team working together mm -hmm. just continually learning and whether it's language mm -hmm. or or the um, what's growing around um, mm -hmm. so that that working together as a team to just continue to build build knowledge and then share share that with uh, community mm -hmm. is, is really incredible. So thank you so much for, for all that you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we appreciate you inviting us onto your road trip. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we always invite, would always have you as part of our road trip. Um, speaking of that, uh, this thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, next week we'll be traveling east uh, to the Dukabor Discovery Center near Castlegard. So we have a long road trip uh, out east, um, <laughs> we'll come away from the coast, um, and uh, and then go go inland a little bit. So again, thank you so much, Allison, and uh, I look forward to, to visiting next time. Uh, I'm up that yeah. way as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, and thanks everyone. And so we're gonna, we'll just stop the record. We stopped the Facebook Live feed okay. and we'll stop the record.